Uh, with Marvels, the thing that I was thinking of was honestly just an anthology series because back in the early, I think it was 1990, maybe even 89, Marvel was doing a prestige format, uh, which basically is the higher quality paper and, you know, um, sort of thick packaging format of a comic book. Prestige format is how they printed Dark Knight Returns. And, and they were getting painted artists to do all these stories inside. And as I'm reading this stuff and buying many of the other painted things that were happening in comics at that time, back in 89, uh, I was thinking, why don't you do this with Marvel characters? And since I was a big history buff, I kind of latched on the idea of something I thought that Marvel hadn't really played with themselves, which is their original publication that launched the entire company was called Marvel Comics back in 1939. That wasn't the name of the publisher. They were actually called Timely Comics. But since they started with that name, I thought, let's make a modern version of that and call it just simply Marvel. And let's make it a, you know, a prestige anthology book with different stories set at different points of the history. The first thing that would connect to that for me is if I retell that first story, which is the origin, first appearance of the Human Torch, but you tell it in a much more adult fashion, where the artwork looks like real people. And my inspiration for why I got so fixated on the Human Torch came kind of out of the blue. It was because I was doing this Terminator comic book series when I was 19, um, for a local comic book company in Chicago. Um, there hadn't yet been a Terminator sequel yet, so this is 1989, but um, I did this trade paperback cover that showed the famous Terminator skeleton walking through a wall of flame, which was very much straight out of a scene in the movie, but it also matched something that James Cameron had said about the film, which was his inspiration that he was working off initially was a dream he had where he saw a skeleton walking through a wall of flame, a metal skeleton. And so that inspiration got me thinking about painting flame, painting the skeleton, and I wanted to get all those details right, but the thing I felt the most comfortable with was, hey, you know what, I think I can actually paint flame. If I study flame better, that's something I don't think I see illustrated accurately. Certainly not in comics where it's all drawn with a black line and it's drawn with all these sort of curly cue kind of shapes that never really look like the actual real thing. And of course, the limitation of comics at that time was that, you know, there wasn't digital coloring that was very painterly or rendered in the way that we take for granted now. And so the idea that if I could illustrate this famous comic book character who originated from then, rebirth him in a way where you're seeing it and believing it, like you're watching a movie, and you think, that looks like a man on fire. Not just a man on fire, that looks like a man who's generating fire, like he's made up of this stuff. You know, that's what got me to thinking of this whole plot rolling out. I just wanted to show what I could do and what I might be useful for in the field of comics as a painter doing comic books. The observer looking in through a story, sort of bringing you into the realism I wanted to apply to the superheroes, is really just a metaphoric reflection of the feeling I had as an, a fan that I wanted to believe this stuff that much more aesthetically. I wanted to look at the comic art and think it was representation of real things and events. And this moment of time of the early 90s was a flashpoint between extremes of art styles. Comics had always kind of gone in one flow over history and then, you know, there's certain kind of cartooning of art that was differing styles in the 70s, 60s, but the late 80s had blown things open for individual art styles to be much more diverse and there would be extremes of cartooning brought in to traditional superhero stuff that would feel much less removed to objective reality. And that's very much what we often think of with uh, the art revolution that was led by the guys who formed Image. The guys like Todd McFarlane and Rob Liefeld and 
um, you know, they're like, not necessarily their partners, Jim Lee and Mark Silvestri, who were more straight in terms of figure drawing and the way they would represent shapes, but the exaggeration started to pull things in one direction, while at the same time, you had this growth of painted realism in comics, which came with Bill Sienkiewicz and John Muth, and eventually Dave McKean, who really have had a huge impact on my way of seeing comics or what I even thought should be my focus in life when I was 19. Um, in 1989, I began the year still being in a dormitory in art school, and that's when Dave McKean's first stuff started to come out that I can recall, um, particularly this series called Black Orchid for DC, where it was a sort of D-list character that he illustrated over what was a breakthrough story for both him and for Neil Gaiman. Um, and I would look at that as like, this is what I want to do with comics. Now I know for sure. I could feel it looking at this as almost being a template. So uh, by the end of that year, he would create the now classic uh, Grant Morrison written Arkham Asylum graphic novel, which had much more of an impact just because he was drawing that many more well-known characters and his painted realism as well as his exaggerated interpretation of things very much influenced by um, Bill Sienkiewicz was given flight in a way that just said like okay a new day is dawning and so you've got these differing art styles of what he and other painters are bringing to comics and the mainstream of comics and then what the mainstream guys who are getting much more into our cartoonish exaggeration, which kind of is the the stuff breathing, breathing the most life into the excitement based around image, and when they formed that company around 90-91. So uh, I obviously felt a connection to one art style and not the other, and so I wanted to jump on that bandwagon, but the key thing I wanted to do that guys like these other painters, including Bill, and McKean and Muth, they did a little bit of dipping their toe in with the superheroes, but this clearly wasn't their bag. They were not interested in the subject matter for the long haul. These were not tried and true fanboys that were just dying to draw superhero comics their whole lives. Or if they were, they got out of their system pretty quickly. And I'm one of the guys who would say, let me paint these guys and I'll spend all of my time doing that. I would love to con convince the next generation of readers to take the characters that much more se seriously in a physically realistic context because that's the way that you inspire is if you believe it as you're looking at it. So it's almost like, well, you've got what was at that time what seemed like millions of readers responding to the more exaggerated cartoony stuff uh, and loving that, but there were a certain number of people um, that were open the other way and and you know I would sort of fall in this cracks of people had a general kind of openness at one point I would make about the stuff with those other f previous painters who preceded me is that they paved a way for somebody like me to come in and exploit that if they opened the door a little bit on painted superheroes people like me and Joe Jusco and Dan Brereton we could come in and really dedicate ourselves to making that really being the the crux of our careers and you know we were much more into wanting to make that seem viable seem that that a market unto itself and so the graphic novels that I would eventually get to do would build upon that potential 